So. Mm. Now, when you said those saboteurs, those protectors, what are you referring to there? Is that like, is that like narcissism, like, like ish or just like. So if we can accept that the psyche and the consciousness itself can fragment, right? What happens when the being encounters a situation of distress, distress, of course, without resolve, which is the definition of trauma. It has no choice but to adapt to whatever that stressor is. The way that it will do that is by splitting between the vulnerable aspect of self and the protective aspect of self. So this is the part that doesn't keep me safe, the part that's really, you know, makes me weaker or puts me at risk of being harmed. And this is the part that doesn't, right? So we get these protector personalities, aspects that say, and by the way, it's whatever whatever adaptive strategy kept you safe in the specific environment you were in. And so you're going to see a lot of differences between these protector aspects, right? I'll give you an example of what I mean. Let's say that you're in a family where weakness is not acceptable. Okay, so you're going to basically take the aspect of you that feels sort of afraid or whatever you identify as weak, and you're going to hide that in your subconscious behind what you're going to see in the personality structure, which is a very aggressive you know, I'm the one that's not afraid type of personality, more like what we identify, you know, when I say protector, that's more the classic thing that we see. But let's take you down to the deep south, for example, yeah. America, where you've got little girls who, let's say they get really angry. Anger is not something we do in this family. Okay, so they are going to take their anger, and that's actually vulnerable because it gets them in trouble. They're going to take their anger. They're going to take their power. They're going to suppress that, and what's going to come forward as a protector to keep them safe is the, hey, y'all, would anybody like some salad? Like that, and that's a protector also, right? So you can have these, these, it's like, don't be fooled by what you're looking at, because whatever sort of projects forward as a protector in the personality spectrum is whatever kept a person safe. And there's many different strategies for that. The saboteur is essentially a protector aspect of self that doesn't care about collateral damage. It's really comparable to like, have you ever met an EMS professional when they're like trying to get to somebody who's in trouble? They're like taking their hacks out of the front door and they're like, I don't, I don't care what I have to take out in order to get to this thing, right? There are some protectors in the spectrum like that where they're like, look, I'm going to lose-lose and I am perfectly willing to choose between, you know, keeping myself safe or getting my needs met in this way and suffering this consequence. I can do that, which means I'm, it, it comes across like a sabotage type dynamic because they're like, you know what? If it's between being consumed in a relationship and losing my sense of self and losing the relationship, but keeping myself, I'll lose the relationship. So here you are in the middle going, ah! <laughs> I feel like I'm always ruining relationships. Why can't I stop? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that's what we mean by a self-sabotaging part. But I mean, the ironic part of it is you don't actually have a part that sabotages you. You have a part that is completely convinced that what it's doing is the best idea and is saving your life. Mm -hmm. And in alignment with these ancestral, you know, ancestral trauma, you have ancestral protectors. You can see these types of, of personality adaptations. These protectors go from father to son to grandson to, you know, and same thing through female lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about trauma and how it's formed in terms of, you know, the same things can happen to different people and they hold it in different ways. So I'd love to hear how you believe trauma is formed and then how we can help it so that the hard things we go through are not held as traumas. Okay. So, so if we, I think that um, if we define trauma again, we're going to get really close to a good answer. Trauma is distress without resolve. So it means I went through something distressing, not stressful, distressing. This is causing, this is a, an anti-movement to my own well-being. It's an antithesis to my sense of health and happiness, right? And what it means to not be able to resolve it is I can find no reasonable way to change that situation in and of itself so that it is not causing me distress. 
So whether somebody is is ultimately going to experience trauma when they go through something difficult or not has to do with their capacity to resolve it or not. And that's down to a whole host of factors, right? So many factors, there's no way for me to limit them all. I mean, all I could really do is to sit down in a circumstance where somebody is undergoing trauma and be like, this is likely to stick and I'll tell you why, because they're lacking this, 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 and this, or it's likely to be able to be resolved very quickly this way, you know? (laughs) So the work of of our lives and how to not make trauma stick is to resolve the trauma. That means we have to take the distress and find some empowering way to bring about what is preferred, what is wanted, and what is a benefit to our well-being and health. Most often, it's to experience the opposite. So let's say that the distressing situation that you were in is that you were never understood. Okay, so that can be a trauma, and you can develop all kinds of fragments within the personality structure around not being understood. You can be a person who's constantly over-explaining, for example. You have almost like a, um, a lot of people who suffer that have, they're almost like protectors that remind me of managers or therapists where they're just like always over-explaining everything. And it comes from that trauma, right? Well, to heal that is to be understood. So it's really about how do we empower a person towards their own understanding and not like over explaining, which is not really a conscious act. Most people, when they get into that behavior of over explaining themselves as a way of overcompensating for never being understood, they're not really engaged in a conscious process of I would like to experience being understood. And therefore, the best way to go about doing that is A, B, C, D. They're just unconsciously kind of grasping at whatever it is they're wanting and most often doing so from the very people who are least likely to give it to them. Yes. <laughs> is that a good enough answer? Or no? Yes. No, that's totally yeah. perfect and with a really good example. Yeah, my mind's blown. I'm just like <laughs> running in a bunch of different ways. But in regards to intimate relationships, is, is what you're saying is that we'll attract people that often can't give us the opposite of the trauma Yes, and this is why. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, but one of the main reasons that I think is important for people who are watching this to understand why is that the ultimate experience of healing for us would be if we could find something that mirrored and matched the original experience, but to get a different result out of it. Now, I know that sounds nuts. When I, when I verbalize it, most people are like, well, that there is the definition of insanity. It's like it's experiencing the same thing or doing the same thing and expecting a different result. But that's what we so badly want. You know, I'll give you an example of, you know, the average woman, let's say she grows up with a super emotionally unavailable daddy. What you'll see the compulsion towards is I'm going to find a man who's not emotionally available. And if he becomes emotionally available for me, that's the cherry on everything. That's I finally solved, you know, getting a man who was not going to pay attention to me to really be present. But then, of course, we've got this thing where it's like, well, it would be a much more direct thing. (laughs) <laughs> to just be like, well, you know, where do I meet emotionally available men? Where might those guys be spending time? How do I identify them, right? <laughs> that would be, obviously you're going to have a better result there, but you know, we're not we're sort of we've got this compulsion, repetition compulsion for trauma to go and get into the very situation that m- matches and mirrors our original experience to try to get a different result out of it. But then we get re-traumatized. It's just the same thing all over again. Ah, ah, no guys ever going to be present, you know. is it possible to heal within the relationship like you know whose responsibility is it to move towards giving the other person what they need i guess if it's like this awkward match um should i be more understanding probably yes not to say that that's what you need but (laughs) i'm just saying (laughs) you know or should we just be like now you know what we're like our wounds don't match i'll see you later (laughs) let's try this again out there (laughs) a relationship is a very complex dance Mm. i did this video recently that was called uh It was about workability and compromise, the difference between compromise and workability. The rule of thumb pretty much for relationships is that you should be as workable as you can be. When we start to traipse over into what I'm calling compromise, some people use the word for all of it, but what I'm calling compromise is when you're about to give something up that means a lot to you and therefore go in the opposite direction of your own well-being and health 
Mm-hmm. You can't actually do that. Mm-hmm. So for it's it's like for every person, they have to kind of feel out where can I, yes, where can I be workable with this? And where can I answer to my partner in this? Mm-hmm. And where does that now take me down a road where I'm getting, you know, dare I say re-traumatized? Or I'm going in the exact opposite direction of what I feel like is the best for me. Yeah. You can't cross that line. And so could it be true too, that if you cross that line once any sort of time where it's, it's like being presented to be like, you know, um, compromising, you might have trauma because you crossed the line too far and you don't want to compromise at all. So how do we bring it back to the beginning? If you're in a relationship mm-hmm. where maybe you compromise too much and it hurt your well being, mm-hmm. now you're un, you know, untangled and how do we go back to the start? So that that is down to talking to the protector part of you who has taken over and decided on a very rigid boundary. So there will be a part of you that's like, I can't trust you not to bulldoze me. So I'm just going to set a boundary that's 5,000 miles short of what I can do. (laughs) (laughs) So so basically, you got to work directly with that part of you to sort to show it what the consequences of doing so are in a very conscious way and to show it alternatives. These are some alternatives. Like what? Like let's do a deal here. Like and a really good one. Meaning, I, I, it's important to me. Speaking to this part of you, it's important to me that you don't feel like I'm just gonna ignore your boundaries. I don't want to do something damaging. I just want to know where the line actually is. You know, 